Tonight we're going to continue on in our Mark Your Bible series. So I didn't warn you. Hopefully you have your Bibles that you're marking up. If you don't, you can take the verses on the back of the bulletin and do that on your own. This Mark Your Bibles series of verses is actually much shorter than a lot of the other ones that we've uh, done. So that does not mean the sermon will be shorter. I, you know, people get excited when I say that. No. Uh, but it is, a, it is a topic that I think probably gets talked about a lot. How many of you have ever heard somebody complain about their children? One person, really? You are all lying in your seats tonight. I mean, seriously, do you hear people complain about their children or children in general quite often? How many of you have ever complained about your own children? I'm kidding. I'm not going to ask that one. Uh, but, but we do. We, we, we see a problem among children. And there are a lot of issues these days with uh, just a lack of discipline and hard work, a lack of, a lack of work ethic among children, uh, issues with entitlement, issues with disregard for authority, and, and, and I'm not speaking of any of our kids here, but we, we see that in the world. And so one of the conversations that often comes up is, I don't know how to handle this one aspect with my children. Our tendency when we hear that is to give them some of our own wisdom. That, that's our habit. Well... You know, if you, if you want my advice, and we'll share with them what we believe is the right thing to do. And what I think would be much better is to share with them what God says to do. And so if we can get in the habit of opening up that door of conversation with people to get them to look in the Bible that conversation can turn into other conversations from the Bible. And so this is one of those ways that God, I think, puts into our path the opportunity to share with people what they need to do regarding following uh, God's rules for raising children, but then also God's rules for growing your own life in your relationship with God. So let's jump into some verses uh, regarding raising children. I... I I'll be honest, when Tiffany and I first started having children, that was one of the things we did a lot of. We went to people that had raised children successfully, children who loved the Lord, children who were, who were hard workers and, and seemed to be well adapted for life, and we would go get a lot of advice. And it stood out to me when we would do that, how many of them gave us personal advice versus how many of them pointed us to Scripture. And interestingly, always the ones we had the most respect for were the ones who pointed us to Scripture. And that's something that I hope we can start doing for other people. So turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22, a very well-known verse here, uh, right there at verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Some of your versions will, you, know, you see this on nursery walls with a little train and animals sitting in the train. Right? Everybody's seen this verse put together with that picture. Train up a child in the way he should go. Uh, the uh, Christian Standard Bible says, Start a youth out on his way. Even when he grows old, he will not depart from it. There is some discussion as to what the Hebrew actually means here in that first phrase. Does this mean start a child up on the way you know they should go? Or does this mean start a child up after their own personality, you know, on their way? Or is this start a child on God's way? Uh, either way, I, I, again, I don't, I don't know what the right answer is. If the scholars debate it, I'm certainly not going to give you a, a definitive answer. I will say this. The point of the passage is, you should be involved in the path that a child takes. You should be involved in guiding them and directing them and, and kind of taking them by the hand on that pathway as they grow and mature 
And if you'll do that, as they grow older, that, that's what they will fall back on. That will become their default in how to live. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to do. We want to train them the right way, train them on the right path, help them make right decisions, help them follow after right authority figures, help them direct their path, and if we'll do that, then when they get old, it, it gives them the best chance. It gives them the best opportunity to turn out well. And I think that's what we all want. We want to see our children turn out well. Where this comes for us in discussing this with maybe a neighbor who's complaining about their child is instead of joining in on the complaining, which is what we naturally want to do, oh, yeah, children are the worst, right? I mean, you, you want to you join in, you want to commiserate. And, and the misery of children. Instead of doing that, just go, there's a lot of children who just haven't been put on the right path yet. That's exactly what the Bible says. Train up a child in the way he should go when he's old, he won't depart from it. That's a really simple way to bring people back to the Bible's answer for it. And, and that's what our goal should be in having some of these discussions. Our next verse is Proverbs chapter 23, the very next verse here, or chapter in Proverbs, Proverbs 23, verse 13. Don't withhold discipline from a youth. If you punish him with a rod, he will not die. Now that is very contrary to modern sociological teaching on how parenting should go, that you should only use positive reinforcement that you should never use uh, uh, corporal, no, what, what's the term? Is it corporal? Corporal punishment. I one time said capital punishment, and I, I didn't want to make that mistake again uh, because the Bible actually gives you that, not us, but the Old Testament gave them that right too. But, uh, you know, th there's nothing wrong with corporal punishment. Now, I will say there are people who use corporal punishment for selfish purposes. That's wrong. To get my anger out through it. Or to lash out at a child. Or to, to overreact. Or to you know, do so without everything that goes with it, which we'll talk about in a few moments. But to use corporal punishment for the purpose of training a child and bringing them discipline, that is a good thing. Do not, if, you, if you punish a child with a rod, he will not die. If I, for whatever reason, need to have my child go pick a switch, that is, if it is done for their benefit, a good thing. And so we need to be those who realize the Bible the Bible says there is value in corporal punishment. The world will tell you no, that that's not true. But the Bible says there's value in it. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we recognize that. We are left oftentimes with, and this is not what I would lead off with with your neighbor, of, well, you just need to spank the child more, right? That's, that's kind of our, our tendency. I've heard people say that. You just need to spank the child more. That might be true, but that does not mean that's your leadoff. Like that, that, that shouldn't be your first piece of advice that you go to. Okay? Maybe we need to talk about what corporal punishment does and why it works, which we're going to do tonight in our lesson. Uh, but there is value in it, and we need to make sure that we're not listening to the world's advice on how to raise children with all positive reinforcement and just give them what they want because the world's advice has led to entitlement and issues of entitlement. And we don't want that for our children. You know what the, the, the short term for entitlement is? Brat. Okay? We don't want a bunch of brats running around. We want a bunch of children who are raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord running around. And so we'll, we'll get to some verses about that in a moment. Proverbs 13, verse 24. Okay, this one goes a little bit further than the last one from chapter 23. The one who will not use the rod hates his son, 
but the one who loves him disciplines him diligently. The one who will not use the rod hates his son. That's, that's pretty bold, isn't it? Do you know why that is true? Because the one who refuses to use the rod cares more about their own feelings than they do about the future of their children. And that's not good. When you care more about how you feel that, well, I, I, I don't want to hurt, uh, I, I don't want to damage our relationship, I don't want, you know, and there's all these different reasons why people won't extend the rod to a child. When, when you don't, what you are doing is you are choosing your own way over what is best for the child. And that's dangerous. And that does not lead to a good future. I also loved, and you'll, you'll see this, uh, different translations use different words, but one of the things I love about the Christian Standard Bible is that it keeps using the word discipline. The, the one who loves him disciplines him diligently. And I love that word because the point of discipline is the idea of training or bringing a good effect for the future. If I tell somebody who's really having trouble losing weight because I just can't get up early and, and do the exercises that I need to do, and I go, well, you need to have more discipline. Okay, I, I'm not telling that person you need to beat yourself into submission to yourself. What do I mean by that? When I tell them they need to have more discipline, I'm telling them they need to have more control over themselves, control over their feelings, control over their, uh, their difficulties. One of the best pieces of, of advice I ever received was from a guy named, we were telling somebody about this the other day, but from a, a, a friend of ours named Tom Hamilton. He's actually the uh, head of the biblical studies department down at Florida College now. But he had come and he had done a meeting for us on... Uh, godly parenting, and it was one of the best meetings I ever sat through. Some of the stuff he said was stuff I had never thought about, and this is one of those things uh, that relates to discipline. He had said, you know, we use the phrase oftentimes, a strong-willed child. You all have heard that phrase before, strong-willed child. He goes, we use that phrase wrong, because the reality is what we call a strong-willed child is actually a weak-willed child because they have not yet learned the ability to have control over their feelings or control over their emotions and outbursts. And so they are actually not being strong-willed when they are being stubborn and acting out emotionally. They are having a weak will. They are not in control of their feelings. They have not learned the discipline of themselves and therefore we need to help them be strong-willed. That, that just perspective difference made a huge difference for me in the way that I thought about parenting. Because the idea was our job is to train this child to be strong, to be in control of themselves, to be in control of the way that they act and their behavior, to be able to, even in difficult circumstances, even in emotional circumstances, to be able to get themselves under control and make right decisions. That comes from learning discipline. And that comes from being disciplined. I, I just, you might not be floored by that, but I was floored by that as, as a young parent because it helped me learn a lot. I mean, Gibson, not to pick on Gibson, but Gibson is extremely stubborn. But Gibson has, in a lot of ways, learned to control his feelings and emotions and his, his stubbornness and direct it the right way so that now he is stubborn towards things he wants to achieve. He is not stubborn against something he is wanting to fight. And those are two very, 
same quality, but a quality used in very different ways can be either very good or very negative. And he has learned to control his will. So we need to be those who are willing to discipline our children because in so doing, we are loving them. We are helping them have a better future. We are helping them to grow as, uh, as people. That was the other really big piece of advice. I asked Tiffany uh, on the, uh, before we, we came this evening, what were the, the pieces of advice? She says the other one after that uh, strong-willed, weak-willed paradigm was that our job is not to raise children, it is to raise adults. And so our job is not to go, oh, they're being weak-willed children over there. Isn't that lovely? No, our job is to raise them to be adults. And part of the, one of the qualities that shows the difference between maturity and immaturity or adulthood and childhood is the ability to control the will. You know, I don't want to get up and go to work today, but because I am an adult, I have to make that hard decision to do what I don't want to do. You had some of those moments lately? Yeah. Yeah. You know what the difference is between us adults and a three-year-old? A three-year-old doesn't have to make those decisions yet. And so our job is to raise them to make adult decisions and to act like adults. So anyway, all right, keep going. Proverbs chapter 29, two verses here, verse 15 and verse 17. The rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a youth left to himself is a disgrace to his mother. Discipline your child, and it will bring you peace of mind and give you delight. And so again, the role of discipline in the raising of children is of, of utmost importance. Uh, it is something that we need to use for the benefit of raising these children right. My job is not to beat a child so that they feel bad about what they did. Now that's probably a, a side effect of using the rod. But the purpose of using the rod is not merely to, to whack them into submission. It is to impart wisdom. And we'll talk about what that looks like in just a moment. Because a child who has no wisdom is going to be a disaster. They're, they're going to make awful decisions. They're not going to be able to hold down a job. They're not going to be able to, to, to function in regular life and be able to pay their bills and do the things that they need to do down the road. They're not going to have the ability to respond to authority well. They're going to talk back or talk bad about their boss and get in trouble for that one day. They're not going to know how to love their wife or their husband one day. They are going to be entirely self-seeking self-motivated, and selfish. Because that's what we do when we're left to our own devices. But when you use the rod of correction for a child to give them wisdom, to give them discipline, to give them the ability to work hard and to make hard decisions, well then you're going to set them on the right path. And when you get to that end of the end of the road where, you know, they're 18 and they're moving out and they're going to college and, and they're having to make decisions about what career they're going to choose and where they're going to end up, you're not going to sit there fretting about, oh, they're not going to be able to manage life. Oh, this is going to be horrible. You're going to have peace of mind because you've raised them to act like adults. You've raised them to make difficult decisions. You've raised them to think through all of their options and realize this is the best of my decisions and let me go this direction. You will raise them ideally to be someone who chooses God above all else. And at the end of that, you will watch them fly the, the, the net away from the nest and you will be proud of them and excited for them because the next place they go is going to be a wonderful place. And that's, that's what God is shooting for here in giving us these directions. If children are left alone, they bring shame to their parents. And so we don't want to give them that opportunity. But a well-disciplined child will be a delight to their parents. 
And, and by this, understand, and, and I think you will in just a moment when we get to some of these other verses, my, my point tonight is not we need to spank children more. That might be true. I don't know where you're at on that. My point is we need to discipline children more. And that might be in the form of a rod. It might be in the form of a, a long talk. It might be in the form of, of, of giving them you know, opportunities to find their answers in Scripture for themselves instead of always giving them the answer uh, that you think they should believe. But giving them that ability, you know, my, one of the worst punishments I ever received was not a spanking, it was a project. Uh, my, when I was being unruly as a child, my parents tried everything with me. Uh, they I, I, I think I was still getting beaten with a belt when I was like 14, 15, 16 years old. Like that, that was part of my life, uh, and, and, and deservedly so, thinking back on those years. Uh, my parents tried grounding me. One time I was grounded for nine months straight, literally. Every time they were like, well, let's give him a chance. Whoa, never mind, he's still stupid. So they'd pull everything back. One of the worst punishments I was ever given was my dad told me I had two weeks, I think it was two weeks, to go out to the side of the yard and I had to dig up the, what was called red tips. Uh, they were these tall hedge bushes, like 10, 15 feet tall, and they had green leaves and a red top to them. This is over in South Carolina. And, and my dad wanted me to chop them down. It was like 12 of them. I had to chop them down, chop them up, and dig up the stump. That was my job. Those things had a massive taproot. And so I had to have to dig this huge hole around them to get down beneath the root ball so that I could even get to the taproot to be able to chop it off to get this thing to even fall over so that I could deal with the rest of it. It took every spare moment I had. And I was exhausted by the end of it wasn't a rod, but was it my, was it discipline? Yeah, it was correction. My dad would frequently come out while I was working and talk to me about all the things that I had done wrong, so now I'd have to sit there huffing and puffing about the axe and the hatchet and the shovel and listen to him criticize me at the same time, and I, we, we, it was just a long, drawn-out punishment. Never forgotten it. My dad also got some yard work done, which I win-win for him. Horrible for me. But anyway, uh, you know, it, was, it, was a, uh, it, it was a way for him to discipline and train me. And that's what we need to do. Okay, Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your son while there's still hope. Don't set your heart on being the course to the cause of his death. You discipline your son while there's still hope. I hear, uh, unfortunately, sometimes parents talk about how they just, they've lost all hope with their child. They've lost all t opportunities to, to train them. You know, the child's now left home and they're, they're going off these, these other directions and they just, parents just don't understand why and they just don't know what to do. And, and I'll be honest, that, that is a, a very difficult set of circumstances to live through. Uh, I, I, just the idea of not knowing what else you can do, that's scary. And, and so here, the direction we're given in Proverbs is do the discipline while you can, while it is effective, while it is something that you can do that will build a relationship instead of tear a relationship down. Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 4, a passage where very familiar with children, obey your parents and the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up your anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So here we've got direction to children, but there's also direction to fathers that I think is a, a really important issue here. 
First of all, the goal of raising these uh, child-sized adults is that they be an obedient and honoring child. Uh, That should be the very first litmus test of any parent. If your child is not an obedient, if you would not describe them as an obedient child, then something is wrong. Something needs to change. Some, something about the way you approach this needs to change. It's not the child's fault. It's your fault as a parent. You need to change your approach, change your process, ask for advice from others, do something, because your goal, what, what you should be doing is giving them Uh, an opportunity to be both obedient and honoring. Now, again, I think that's important. There are a lot of children who have been forced into compliance but don't actually honor their parents. And this this is two things. It is obedience and honoring. That's probably one of the other greatest pieces of advice I've ever been given as a parent is your goal is not to, to change their behavior. It is to change their heart. That's your goal as a parent. Because you can, you can control a child through fear, but that child will never honor you just because they fear you. You can control a child because uh, they are afraid of consequences. And maybe that is a, a temporary measure. But the goal is not to control the child so that they don't embarrass you or control a child because as long as you're, they're in your house, they're going to do what you say. The goal is to get a child to honor you. And through honoring you, they honor your, your father, your God. And so if we can do that, Part of the way we do that, fathers, is that we don't stir up anger in our children. And that sounds so odd because you think, well, if I don't spare the rod, well, then that's going to make them angry, right? Don't those two things go hand in hand? No. And you'll see that in our next passage. Uh, Or actually this one. But bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Some versions say uh, the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Uh, here we've got this idea of there is two sides to training children. It is not just discipline. It is also instruction. Both. In the same setting where we learned that where their job is not to control their behavior, it's to control their heart. Uh, I think in that same book we had read, uh, made the point that you need to give children an opportunity to do things right. So if your child acts ugly and lashes out, let's say your your three-year-old pitches a fit, the job is not to just spank them, reprimand them from their behavior, and send them away. That, That really doesn't teach a lot. But if you take the time to maybe spank them and correct their behavior, but then you sit down with them and you talk about what's the better course of action. How do we do this better? How do we ask for that toy better? How do we show that we don't like what mom and dad said better? Now let's practice that. Let's go through that process of, uh, of doing that better. I think it was just today, Maple pulled Janie's hair because she wanted Janie to give her a toy. And I watched Tiffany do this. She goes, nope. We're going to stop, and she, she sat down, and she had a conversation with Maple, with Janie standing right there, who was crying on me because she was hurt, and, and she had a conversation with Maple about what Maple needed to do differently than that, and then we gave the toy back to Janie, and we had Maple go through the process of asking for the toy appropriately and rightly, and then Janie handing the toy to her and doing it in the right way. That is discipline and instruction. Do you see how both of those are necessary? I've told y'all before, the worst part for me in getting punished as a kid, and I was very experienced at that, getting punished as a kid was not the punishment, it was the 30-minute conversation that went with the punishment. 
I mean, if it were just the punishment, I would have done things wrong all the time because, hey, I can just get away with it. What's, what's a, a spanking? You know, no big deal for me. I was very pain tolerant. So just give me the spanking, I'll move on. But no, the worst part was my dad would come down and he would, he would give me the spanking and there would be this long talk that went along with it. And it was like, can we just move on? Not with my dad, not moving on. I got sermons almost every day of the week. That training, the instruction, is key. It is not just a rod of correction, but it is instruction also. And we can instruct them on how to make better decisions and how to train, change a weak will into a strong will. And if we can help a child do that through instruction, it, it is very helpful. Colossians chapter 3, verse 21 similarly says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they don't become discouraged. Okay, it's not just about don't anger your children, but don't exasperate your children. The goal of punishment and discipline is that it should lead to positive feelings, positive behavior, and respect. That's the goal. That's what we should be doing with our discipline. And I'm going to tell you, this is one of the hardest things for me. Because one of the quickest ways we can exasperate our children is by being inconsistent with the way that we train them. We let them get away with it, get away with it, get away with it, and then boom, we, we like throw our hands up in the air and we're all angry and veins are popping out and we're upset and we're yelling at them. And they're like, well, you weren't. You weren't upset the other three times I did it. Why is it wrong now? And that inconsistency makes it hard to know what am I going to get? When is it wrong? How far can I go? Because children are always going to test how far they can go. And so if you'll just be consistent, be loving, be, be generous with your instruction, Make sure that you talk them through what the expectation is so that they know how to make the right choice next time. That also lets you as a parent get less exasperated because now you know they are choosing to do wrong. This is not just a they don't understand issue. But if we can build that relationship of parenting where we are working together toward positive feelings and positive behavior and respect, that can go a long way. I, I tell you, one of the big signs to Tiffany and I when we were first starting parenting was that we would find parents, and this is kind of difficult, find parents who we watched the way their adult children responded to their parents. Do their adult children desire to still have a great loving relationship with their parents or is it always a complaint about their parents or a disrespect for their parents and those types of things we wanted to see children who were brought up to respect and honor their parents because that says a lot about the way they were brought up and we need to be the kind of people who who are doing the hard work of giving our children something to respect last passage for this evening is psalm 127 3 through 5 Sons, or children, are indeed a heritage from the Lord, offspring, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons born in one Jew. Happy is the man who has filled his quiver with them. They will never be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gate. And so we need to be people who are uh, clearly very, uh, you know, Children are a blessing. They are not, uh, I, and I see this a lot in our, in our culture these days, children are seen as a, a bit of a burden and talked about as if they are a burden. I, I'm guilty of doing this myself. Sorry, guys. You know, uh, but that idea of, you know, children, they are, they are a blessing. from They're a gift from God. 
And we need to act like that. We need to have that kind of honor and respect, especially in God's church. One of the things I, I have noticed through the years is that we, we kind of have this southern sentiment that children should be seen but not heard, and that you know they kind of need to go off and be in their own space and do their own thing and be over there kind of disregarded and off to the side. But the problem with that is that children learn that that's, that's their place, and they don't actually feel like they have a place in God's people when we do that, and that can be dangerous. It can create an attitude of children who don't think they, they grow up, and we always see them as children all the way until they leave home, and, and we have shoved them to the side for all those years, and now we're wondering why when they're 18, 19 years old and heading off to college, they also leave the church. Of course. They've never been told they, they belong there. They've been told they're expected to be there. Attendance is important not actually belonging. And that's dangerous. If children are a blessing from the Lord in the home, then they are also a blessing from the Lord in the church. And we need to see that. Now, again, that does not mean that you know, undisciplined children are a blessing because that can become a, a burden, right? If we will raise children the way the Bible teaches us to raise children, they truly are a blessing. But if we won't raise them the way God says to raise them, then they seem much more like a burden. And so we need to be people who are doing the hard work of raising our children and disciplining them and teaching them how to make good decisions, teaching them how to respect adults and authority, teaching them uh, how to, to do right things and have a right heart. And if we'll do that, then we will see them as a great blessing from God. They will never be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gate. Uh, that, that phrase, that they will be people who are able to go out into society in difficult circumstances and be able to succeed and do well. That's our goal, isn't it? That's what we're shooting for. And hopefully that, you know, many of you, your children have already grown Hopefully that's what you've seen. For those of us who are still in the middle of it, that's our goal. We want our children to do well. And so we'll do the hard work of making sure that happens. One of the great descriptions we have in Scripture is that we are children of God. And I think about it in these terms sometimes. Am I a... A, a disciplined child of God who makes God proud, or am I one of those unruly children of God who is nothing but an exasperation to my father? That's my choice. If I will live for God and obey him and, and work hard to, to bring him honor and, and show respect to him, and, uh, it, then, then I, will, I will be a good child. But if I'm going to go out and seek my own way and pitch a fit when things don't go the way I want them to, well, then I'm that entitled, spoiled brat. And I need to make sure that I'm being a good child of God. If you're not